Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us today. We have about 23 people in the room and 22 people online. So I think certainly quorum to get started. Uh, this session is on public-private data partnerships with a particular focus on the global south, the majority world. We are going to talk about the practical problems and possibilities around public sector and private sector and civil society working together using data to achieve various development objectives, particularly the SDGs. We know the argument that data is essential for understanding where we are uh, in achieving the SDGs and sometimes to actually achieving the SDGs. So not just for monitoring it, but for achieving it as well. We have uh, two speakers next to me uh, here. I will introduce each one very briefly because everyone's bio is online. And we have uh, four speakers online and an online moderator. So I will first invite uh, Philip Schonrock, who is the director of SEPE, an independent think tank that works through field-based analysis and high-level advocacy to scale up the participation of Latin America and Caribbean within the global development agendas to uh, set the stage about why on earth do we even need to talk about this public-private data partnerships. Philip, over to you. Well, good morning, Helani, to you. A very early morning from uh, Cali, Colombia, and I'm happy to, to join you today. And I'm going right in to what my colleague Helani just mentioned, five think tanks and universities from across uh, the regions, and especially the Global South, as it was mentioned. Uh, we came together with the support of IDRC to understand one main point, which was the extent of which the private sector uh, data related contributions to the public policy in the global south are adding value very specifically uh, we will be talking about our exploration into three concrete phases the extent first to which and how the private sector has contributed to the so-called data revolution of the SDGs. The second point is that their contribution to good data governance practices. And last but not least, we will be talking today about the challenges that we are facing, not only from the private sector, but especially from government and civil society, attempting to use and to work together uh, on the sources of data. I believe, most importantly, uh, to let my uh, colleagues talk uh, and see what we actually found out through a mapping exercise in five regions in eight case studies with companies in looking at how we actually uh, are able to produce much better value uh, if we monitor and document these actions. And I will, before giving over to Elani uh, uh, before, I believe it is important to mention that across all regions in the global south, the most successful examples that we have found in public public uh, public private data initiatives are the ones which partners have invested first time efforts and needed to establish a proof to concept build trust and adapt and iterate the value of, uh, proposition over time and i believe uh, Elani, I will turn over to you in mentioning the significant challenges to initiating that we had, completing and monitoring, uh, and especially in scaling up uh, private uh, public data initiatives because the lack of coherence that we found across under development and standards operating procedures needed to develop them. So this is all from my side, uh, Elani. I will hand over to you because a lot of our colleagues will be sharing their insights with us now. So over to you and thank you for giving me the floor. Let me ask you a quick uh, rebuttal question before we move on to the next speaker. Um, wasn't this a you know, started with a lot of hype that the private sector would be a huge partner in the SDGs in monitoring. So, um, I mean, are we s we're still talking about it seven years from everyone collectively not achieving the SDGs. Is that why this is really important now? Or shouldn't this have already happened? I mean, private sector should be working uh, quite efficiently with uh, public sector. 
Yes, we should. Uh, and it is not still happening on the... Uh, we are still on the hype, but not on the how. Uh, I believe we have had quite a lot of good examples, but what we have had is not an enabling environment uh, where the private sector comes together with the other actors. I believe this is something we have seen throughout the last seven years, that this hype has not... Uh, brought together actually the data community and the tech community uh, with the official statistics to close data gaps. And I believe the most important thing to say here is the hype has not remained. It has been losing ground and we are not closing still the data gaps that we need. Good examples are out there. We will show them, uh, but there it's imperative that we have these partnerships, especially uh, in the global south, in order to help us uh, in those data gaps like climate change, poverty, inequality, and that's where still we are still missing the point. And like I said, we are not seeing the enabling environment at all levels in order to connect. Thank you, uh, Philip. Um, I've now asked Isuru uh, Samaratunga, who's sitting on my right, your left. He, he's a research manager at Learn Asia, which is a pro-poor, pro-market think tank working in uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, Isuru leads Learn Asia's qualitative research work across a range of digital technology policy issues. Uh, what I've, we've asked him to do is to frame the discussion by summarizing some of the findings uh, of this Global South uh, study to understand the state of play through some evidence. Yep. Uh, thank you, Helani. And hope you can see my slides. Yes. Uh, so actually, uh, Philip talked about like why uh, public-private data partnerships are important in Global South. So let me take you through some of uh, key findings of our research that we did on uh, public-private data partnerships. Uh, so just for you to give you the context, I mean, uh, from this study, we tried to explore the uh, private uh, sector involvement in uh, data-related initiatives. Also then how those initiatives can have an impact on public policies as well. Uh, again, we looked at like how these uh, public-private data partnerships can be contributed to uh, achieve uh, SDGs as well as if you want to monitor such uh, uh, achievements, how these partnerships can be helped as well. Uh, so our study spanned across uh, five regions uh, in the Global South. So these are the countries and the regions that we covered. And uh, so if I tell you a little bit about uh, the methodology that we followed, so we had uh, two uh, work streams to gather data for this particular study. So uh, first one was uh, like a uh, structured mapping study of uh, public-private data partnerships in the Global South. So there we covered uh, 94 countries and also we found uh, 394 data actions. So when I say data actions, that included things like capacity building uh, and skill sharing and also like uh, data collaboration, data governance, uh, data mapping, things like that. And uh, so the second uh, part of this particular study was a kind of a qualitative study that we did. So we selected a few, oh, I would say like eight uh, cases from our mapping study, and we did in-depth case study based on uh, our mapping study findings as well as, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking of the diversity of, the, of these uh, data partnerships also. Um, so that case, uh, eight case studies also covered uh, five regions. And so let me take you through some of uh, key findings of this particular study. Um, so we saw that not all the uh, SDGs are important uh, as same. Uh, so we saw across all the regions, uh, climate actions, uh, sustainable cities and communities, um, uh, and also uh, good health, well-being are the most uh, prioritized or the common SDGs that were focused through mm -hmm. these uh, public-private data partnerships. And also, if you take um, how these SDGs were prioritized by different uh, uh, 
uh, regions, uh, you see uh, the eyes are different. For example, like in Africa, you see that um, uh, good health and well-being has become the, the most uh, important thing. And uh, also in Asia, it is zero hunger and and sustainable cities and communities. But if you go to Caribbean region, that's obviously the quality uh, education. But if you take LATAM and MENA regions, um, more or less it is uh, climate actions that got the attention in data actions. Uh, so, so what we found from these work streams were mainly like there is a tangible value or real world value of these public private data partnerships. So it helps you to monitor and also achieve uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, so we did this study uh, after the pandemic situation and we saw really how that, uh, you know, the common thread or the, the crisis uh, helped on, uh, crisis made uh, different parties to come into partnerships. And if I'm giving you uh, a, a example from ne Nepal, which where we had an earthquake in uh, 2015 where that when people wanted to um, uh, when when after the crisis when the when the uh, vulnerable communities where they are those things when when the government wanted to find out the data analytics helped in that front and um, but also successful uh, partnerships can take time and it needs trust building so uh, because this sort of like uh, partnerships need, um, sometimes need a lot of time because you need uh, uh, partnership building. Uh, and there are sometimes you need to have like a dedicated person from, it can be from the private uh, company or from the government organization. And also we are seeing that large firms with uh, global reach are better able to uh, sustain such relationships. And um, also, it is good if there is a, a legal framework that can be uh, in those countries that can enable the partnerships. And uh, also we saw that some uh, uh, partnerships uh, mostly depend on like uh, personal kind of uh, uh, relationships. So so we saw some partnerships had, hadn't achieve the goals because of a certain you know uh, changes and also due to the informality of those partnerships had so we suggest kind of like a uh, standard uh, operating procedure that might help on those uh, things and um, also uh, the government like to engage with uh, private sector data uh, that have like multiple uh, policy uh, that have an impact on multiple policy areas for example uh, one study in uh, Indonesia where we found that a big data analysis of uh, transport, uh, public transport users in Jakarta city where that analysis helped the, uh, helped the government to not only to plan their public transport but also to understand the demographics of the people who are using uh, the public transport, for, for example, like um, the the gender and also the uh, the vulnerability, the disabilities of these people and uh, the the persons who are using the uh, public transport as well. So that helped a lot in many fronts. And uh, so this uh, brokerage role, there uh, it can change, it can help the public-private partnerships. When I say brokerage role, it is like um, as a as a mediator or kind of a facilitator. You you connect. Uh, the public sector and the private sector, because uh, there, is, there are like um, gaps, uh, for example, like skill gaps and also capacity uh, gaps as well. So these brokerage uh, entities can fulfill those gaps and uh, the bridge can be, uh, can be really success and also can provide uh, good uh, insights into data uh, and the uh, analytics as well. So, uh, so uh, n also again like uh, provi uh, providing technical infrastructure also important that also can be provided by the by the uh, brokerage uh, bro brokers in certain occasions so uh, these are the like main uh, findings that we uh, uh, we can 
share with you uh, from our this uh, study. Uh, but uh, happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. So Isuru, I'm guessing when you did this mapping study, companies and initiatives don't go and say, oh, we're working on this SDG. They are working on some partnerships, right? So what do you do? You go and try and read through it and try and assign some SDG, like in that chart that you showed us? Yeah, exactly. So we saw that some organizations, they, they do a lot of good work, but they don't know that they, it can be contributing to um, uh, one or two or multiple like a, a SDG. So in that case, we need to, I mean, from research perspective, if I say we had a kind of a definition on like how to, how to identify these uh, SDGs and their contribution to uh, certain, you know, achievements and all that. So we did that classification and see where the most of uh, 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 like outcomes of those actions are aligned uh, with uh, uh, SDG and then that's how we did that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to come next to Mike Flanagan who is joining us online. He is the corporate vice president at Microsoft and he leads customer success and services globally for Microsoft's commercial customers and products. And Microsoft is one of the companies that came up repeatedly uh, in some of the studies I think that you know you were showing. Interestingly, not just about sharing data, but doing a lot more of the data action, setting the standards, providing infrastructure, providing uh, capacity building, and so on, and across all the regions. So Mike, you don't run a philanthropy. You run a commercial business. How does Microsoft, and perhaps other organizations, but certainly yours, how do you look at this trade-off between generating revenue and what looks like philanthropic activity, which is a government or a civil society organization comes knocking and says, we've got a problem, your data can really help us understand where we are or solve that problem? I, I think for us, uh, partially, it starts with uh, culture and the belief that um, companies that can do more should do more. Uh, and certainly Microsoft is in a very fortunate position in terms of our ability uh, to do more. Uh, you'll notice in all of our disclosures, uh, for example, in corporate social responsibility, uh, we do actually map a lot of the work that we do back directly uh, to the SDGs. Uh, and because we're because of the way in which we we track uh, our work against those, um, you know, we are are not only very proud of of what we're able to do, but we're able to track uh, a lot of the work that we do back to the direct impact. Uh, I think in the past fiscal year for us, we supported nonprofits around the world uh, with nearly four billion dollars in discounts and donations, um, which many technology providers do. But going beyond that. Uh, we also have uh, created the Microsoft Cloud for Nonprofits, uh, which is bringing all of our product capabilities together, but around a common data model uh, for nonprofits that brings together data sources for the purposes that most nonprofits need, things like attracting and growing their donors, uh, delivering their programs at scale, engaging with their, their audiences, these are things that are common and require a common data model, uh, but we pair that uh, work that we've done around the data and the data modeling uh, with uh, discounts and such so that uh, not only are we providing commercially more, to, uh, more approachable technology solutions, uh, we're doing that in a way uh, that also empowers uh, through common data models uh, it to be easier for nonprofits to achieve their mission uh, with a lower uh, lower overall investment from their organization. Um, and so I, you know for for Microsoft, we don't see them as mutually exclusive. Uh, we you know we believe that a lot of the work that we do uh, in uh, enabling uh, the commitments that we make around philanthropy uh, actually not only does you know does does good for the world, but ultimately helps our commercial objectives. Uh, and then, you know, we also, as I mentioned, believe that through our commercial objectives, uh, we have a responsibility uh, to give back. Uh, one of the things that you, we, we, we talk a lot about is data. And I, I mentioned some of the data modeling that we're doing. 
Um, I think over the past three years, Microsoft has launched uh, 23 different collaborations around data across nonprofits, universities, companies, and governments um, that help promote access to data. Uh, one of the things that we've learned from that is that, uh, you know, while open data is really important for impact, uh, data doesn't always have to be fully open in order to be useful. So sometimes even if data can't be made public due to privacy or commercial sensitivities, uh, there are ways that that data can be used um, in a more open way so that we can break down some of the silos. Uh, and I think that's one of the areas uh, in, in which we need to continue to do more. And one of the things I think, given Microsoft's sort of size and large market shares, what you say makes total sense because eventually, even if the market uh, capture is in 10 years, you can afford to make those kinds of investments. But I'm curious how it works inside the company. At a large company, the marketing guys are probably on a quarterly um, sort of bonus or annual bonus scheme, right? The other feedback of the long-term market opening up, because let's say you go into a relatively low digital connectivity country, eventually you'll gain high market share for Microsoft products by helping this country achieve some of the digital um, SDGs. But that's a sort of a different time frame. Is there a conflict of incentives inside uh, among different sort of business units? Um, uh, or, and how do you deal with it? I mean, of course, there are the realities of uh, the obligations that we have to our shareholders. But part of what uh, we, you know, part of what we are extremely clear about, uh, is that our shareholders expect that, uh, by and large, economic growth must be inclusive. Um, so, you know, we we don't hear from our shareholders that it's all about profit. And so, uh, our executives and our people in the way that their compensation is structured also do not hear that it's all about profit. Uh, we believe, of course, that we have responsibilities commercially, but that as we achieve our, our economic growth as a company, that must be inclusive. So we have to help individuals and organizations and communities um, to succeed, uh, because ultimately, if we are uh, doing the things that um, you know that, that we need to do, the commercial uh, results will 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 come from that. But also, uh, we will have uh, you know a, a world that is more. Um, you know, more equitable and uh, better for all of us uh, to operate in. Uh, if I, you know, if I think about um, the, the skills that we need to build around the world, uh, we have a, a, a huge gap in skills today around technology in general, around data in general, cybersecurity uh, and AI are particularly acute areas of need where if we don't help with building those skills, and helping uh, train people for the jobs of the future, uh, ultimately we won't have the people that we need uh, to do the work uh, that, um, that that fuels our future growth. So we see a lot of those investments not only as good for the world, uh, but also uh, good for the future uh, of the company. And so I think those uh, short and long-term objectives can be balanced by commercial organizations. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm going to ask Darlington Okongo, who is joining us online. He's the founder and CEO of many companies, including Mino Health AI Labs and others that are working in the AI space. Uh, he also, interestingly, is lead, for example, he's lead for the topic group on AI for radiology at the ITU and the WHO, focus group on artificial intelligence and health. So he straddles this sort of very specific AI in a local market, uh, as well as this global um, multilateral data, health, and agriculture kind of roles. So given these two roles, um, Darlington, if you can hear me, could you talk about the biggest sort of challenges uh, in forming partnerships? We know AI is driven by data, and your companies may also be producing data. Uh, what are the challenges and are they different at a very local national level versus maybe at an international level where you're tr trying to do something for the globe? Thank you. Right. I mean, uh, thank you for having me. That's a very interesting question. So the starting point is this. 
public sector, say government, usually have the reach and the access. So, you know, if you're looking at the government of a country and you want to do something in agriculture, for example, we did a project in agriculture, the government has extension officers in every district of the country. You in the private sector probably don't have that reach, or it takes a very long time to build that reach. What the private sector really offers, especially if you're looking at startups, is innovation. So they can come up with how to, you know, better leverage that access to create new data, create solutions out of it. So that's the major opportunity that lies there. Now, the challenges is that because, you know, public sector is different, private sector is different, usually there's a language barrier. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, public sector communicates a certain way, they go about things in a certain way, they are certain, you know, procedures, which for a private sector entity can be quite frustrating to deal with or even understand. And sometimes it's, it feels like, you know, you're speaking different languages. And so that, that's, that's the largest challenge uh, I see. Sometimes too, you need to make it clear what are the incentives from both sides. Because if it's not clear, then it leads to this on, you know, problematic back and forth where, you know, the government has a certain angle to what they want from the partnership, private sector wants a certain angle. But the language barrier and all of this can usually be solved if you have a facilitating person or entity. So for us, for example, we have someone who has had years of working within that space. They were the regional director of AstraZeneca and have done a lot of PPP partnerships. And so when we brought them in, they facilitate all the you know, public sector engagement for us, but also sometimes you can have uh, international development agencies that are funding projects that require PPP. In that case, they can facilitate that kind of uh, relationship because they have extensive years of working with private sector or as well as, you know, extensive years of working with a uh, uh, government. But to highlight just two of this success, so I mentioned the one in agriculture. We formed a partnership that was actually both government and then public university and then ourselves, and we were able to collect data across every single region of Ghana, which is about 16 regions, and then we replicated this in four different African countries and so this was for disease and pest data sets, which was a project funded by Lacuna Fund. And this data set was then used to build AI solutions to help farmers. And out of this, we ended up creating the largest disease and pest data sets in the world. It wouldn't have been possible if we didn't have that PPP. And in healthcare, you know, we built AI systems now that are able to interpret medical images to support detection and everything. And we've now formed partnership with you know, public health institutions that are giving us access to about 100 years of data on Africans. And we are using this data now to build you know, large language models, something similar to let's say GPT-4, but then for healthcare, for radiology, all the other sectors combined. And outside of that, we wouldn't have had access to that data because you, know, you need a public institution that has been around for years to then give you access to that data and then, you know, you find out how it can be beneficial to them. So when we build this AI solutions, sometimes the public institutions that give us this data use the AI stem for free without having to pay us. So there has to be clear objective, clear incentives. Um, and I'm guessing this is anonymized and not personally identifiable data, but that would be one of the policy challenges, particularly in the health sector, less so in agriculture. Do you come across these and how do you deal with that kind of problems, policy? Exactly, yes. So one starting point is data protection laws. You have to look at the data protection laws within the country you're operating in. And for most of them, you know, they would usually tell you P. So PII should not be something that, you know, you should be dealing with. You should try to anonymize the data. And so Ghana, for example, has had data protection laws for several years now. And it's quite clear what you can do. You need the consent of users if you need to, you know, uh, assess certain data, even if you anonymize it and everything. So, yeah, you have to look at those, those laws. They are important. But the issue sometimes is that some countries don't have data protection laws. 
But just to be on the safe side, just take the standard. If you want to use GDPR, which is one of the most, you know, uh, well-defined versions, you can take it and leverage uh, it. And just, you know, in the future, you don't want to create issue because you do, in healthcare, for example, you are building solutions that are beneficial to people. But at the same time, you don't want to have to do it in a way that is irresponsible because at the end, it will cause damages to even your good intentions become muddied by, you know, bad outcomes. So just to be on the safe side, even if there are no regulations that are preventing you from doing it, just do the right thing. It saves you in the long term. Thank you, Darlington. Um, we now come to Uh, Dr. Mona Dimaidi, who is an entrepreneur and women's rights advocate and from the Anaja National University in the state of Palestine, who is now joining us online. Um, Mona, you are also an AI researcher. What do you think, I mean, given your sort of professional as well as the academic background, and you've worked in multiple countries, right? Uh, what do you think is the, are the big challenges uh, in international collaborations uh, on data sharing, particularly when it comes to AI research and applications? Thank you so much for your question. I'm very happy to be with all of you today. Uh, so I'll start by saying that we all know that AI research is based on data and have an access to data. So international collaboration and data sharing is super important to achieve um, such good research. So the way I see it is that it's super important to have that kind of collaboration and data sharing for many reasons. And I'll start by having access to diverse data resources. So international actually collaboration could help us understand more the local context of different countries, under, understand more the local challenges of each single country and to work around it. The other main important part in international collaboration is having that kind of pooling resources. So AI research in general, it needs a lot of computational resources, talent, power, and having that kind of sharing resources is super important. Another one important aspect is the cross-cultural understanding. So the way we work now in terms of research, um, each country is actually focusing on its own challenges, trying to capture the data in its own context. However, having that kind of international collaboration is super important to ensure that our research is actually getting into a global aspect. And it's also addressing challenges which, which we're gonna be surprised that most of us are facing it regardless of the countries we're visiting, uh, living in. So it's very important to have that kind of cross-cultural understanding. The other main important part of having that kind of international collaboration is the ethics part. Like most countries now that they have the AI national strategies coming out and AI policies. And one thing that we're still struggling at is the ethical part. How will we ensure that we're actually addressing transparency? How we are we ensuring that we're addressing gender equality regarding the data and the resource we're, or resources we're working on? So having that kind of international collaboration will help us address um, such an issue. And it's also gonna help us in terms of data privacy and security. So you asked me at the, the challenges and obstacles. I think what we're still facing in terms of research and international collaboration is there is still no, um, no structured pipeline between these countries on how to do the data sharing, what kind of policies and data security things we need to focus on, how are we addressing ethics, um, what kind of data could we work on. You know, like each country has its own legal framework and it its own um, uh, policies. So how could we ensure that we're actually interacting with each other in a very transparent way and we're using the data also and uh, deploying the data in a way which actually takes into consideration consideration um, uh, different um, aspects of the data. So th I think these are the main challenges I'm thinking about. However, again, there's a lot of opportunities actually in having that kind of international collaboration. So interestingly, I mean, I, uh, you know, there are data protection laws that are coming up in some countries without any exceptions for uh, taking the data out even for research uh, purposes, without journalistic, you know, exceptions and so on. So you, you just can't transfer that. So who do you work with across borders? Is it other researchers? And also in terms of techniques, does that mean you have to use sort of sophisticated federated learning kind of things which keep the data in the countries but still allows you to use it? Or do you have to get special permission to transfer data across the countries? 
so so in the MENA region context, we work mostly with researchers from other uh, countries. That's uh, the main part. The main issues we're still facing is that a lot of the MENA countries in the MENA region, they still don't have that kind of legal framework related to data privacy and protection and data access. So this is still a huge challenge. So the way we actually play, play around it is either we have that kind of consent uh, agreements with uh, the private sector we're working with. That's uh, one way to look at it. And another thing is that we usually do the analysis and deployment on their own frameworks and platforms without actually taking the data out. And one main issue we're still facing is uh, also the lack of awareness in terms of, so yes, we want to do that kind of research where we go and approach the private sector in the MENA region. There's still a lack of awareness uh, on what kind of applications we could apply the AI on. Uh, they're not that much comfortable in actually providing us with their data. And even if they do, they're super cautious on how the data is going to be used, how it's going to be beneficial from them. The good news is that we did some kind of, I, I'll say very good proof of concepts in terms of having international collaboration in the MENA region. So recently we um, actually deployed um, a, an AI bootcamp across the MENA region in which we brought the governmental, private sector and international experts all together in one small platform to give us more understanding about where we're going, what is the current challenges from the governmental and private sectors, how we could play around, what kind of rules and regulations are we still missing, and all of that. And the good news is that there's a lot of promising promises coming from uh, these sectors. However, we still need to consider the ethical and legal framework in a more cautious way, especially in the MENA region. Thank you, Mona. We finally come to Rodrigo. So Rodrigo, you know, we heard about the really important role that sort of brokers play in, in the stuff that uh, Isuru was presenting. And we certainly saw um, in some one of the case studies that he was referring to, you know, like Pulse Lab Jakarta was part of the UN system, had enormous convening power and brought together the government of Indonesia who were data users and wanted to understand what was happening in the country and private sector partners, including telecom companies, social media companies, et cetera, and brokered the deal and also provided the expertise. So it sounds to me a little bit like, you know, somewhat of your role. So you're the senior program manager at the Trust for Americas, a not-for-profit affiliated with the Organization of American States, which is an intergovernmental body. So in your experience, what does it take to actually bring these partnerships into life and how do you approach this? Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you again for inviting us and considering uh, the trust for, th for this case study. Uh, so first, for understanding a little bit better my, my points, uh, we need to have a, a context of the Latin America and the Caribbean region as one of the most unequal regions in the world. Uh, that faces different challenges around the data ecosystem and um, across um, different countries, um, especially in the Caribbean. So um, the data ecosystem in Latin America has uh, relatively um, little participation from the, public, the private sector, and that is uh, something evident in uh, all the regional conferences around open government and open data. Um, so I would like to uh, just make um, three points of the, or highlight the, the three main findings um, of the case study that resonates the most with the work we are doing in the region. Uh, the first one is uh, one of uh, um, the points that uh, Philip just mentioned when he started the, the presentation that um, the most uh, successful examples of uh, public private data initiatives are one in which the partners have invested time and effort um, to establish a proof of, co of concept, build trust, and adapt and iterate the value proposition over time. And this is uh, especially true, uh, true for us at the Trust, as we have a, a distinctive operating model that focused on uh, basically on, on the final uh, beneficiary and uh, in vulnerable communities. And um, this is especially important in the fact uh, that um, Mike just mentioned in, t in terms of tackling the gap uh, in skills that we face in the region. So uh, we as a nonprofit organization um, affiliated with a multilateral organization as the American uh, Organization of American State, uh, we try to implement um, different projects online um, to the mandates of development, human rights, and democracy. Uh, but we also have a strong DNA in uh, the private sector uh, component. Uh, we, as an organization, uh, were created as part of the OES, uh, but as an arm of the private sector 
um, to participate in um, development uh, initiatives. So that is why uh, I think it's important um, in, the in the case study um, where you mentioned the, um, the, the importance of um, this convening uh, organization and the role in mobili mobilizing uh, private sector actors. Um, one of the, the, ex the main examples that we have um, is the uh, democratizing innovation in the Americas program that mainly focuses on capacity building in digital skills and data uh, literacy, promoting co-creation processes and the developing of local solutions uh, from lo uh, local to local problems. And this uh, uh, specific initiative has been supported by private companies such as Microsoft uh, for the last couple of years, City Foundation, but also uh, has an important role in terms of involving uh, local government, local private sector, um, civil society organizations and uh, academia as well. Uh, in these past nine years, we, we have impacted over um, 11,000 beneficiaries, mainly f uh, youth, but also a representative from civil society, private sector, and other uh, stakeholders. Uh, the final uh, two um, highlights that I would like to mention and that, re that um, resonates um, a lot with the work we do in the region um, is the established relationship of powerful factors in private sector engagement and mobilizing initiatives. And uh, there, is, there is a need of uh, active government and private sector initiatives that provide connectivity between this um, digital um, and data skills demand, um, the capacity building and the employability. Um, recently we have uh, noticed a shift in terms of uh, philanthropic support and in terms of uh, the, the development projects uh, where uh, mainly um, multilateral uh, development banks, for example, requires more synergy between uh, the private sector, the um, government entities, and uh, civil society. I think we have a very uh, strong role there in convening all these um, different partners for um, the sustainable, sustainable development goals. Um, finally, to maybe just mention a, a specific um, example in Jamaica, and I know uh, we have Dr. Manor on there in, in, in the Zoom call that can uh, attest to, the, to this effort. Um, it's one of our projects um, called um, Unleashing the Potential of Jamaican Youth Through Empowerment and Training, uh, where we partner with the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Microsoft, the National Commercial Bank, Bank in uh, Jamaica. Uh, we collaborate with collaborate with the Ministry of Education and youth and uh, local stakeholders in Jamaica to train um, 1,500 youth in digital skills and data literacy. So does this make it easier because you guys are a regional organization? Like when you approach a private sector company, are you saying, you know, we've got five countries that can use your data, so you're not at a country level negotiation? Or does that not make a difference? I think that the platform, the platform we uh, established in the past 25 years, the relationship we have with uh, multinational organization, with uh, government, uh, local governments, national governments, with other big or multinational or multi-Latina companies, I think that kind of platform um, allows us to um, have or generate trust in, in terms of uh, getting new partners on board. And that has been one of the main strengths or, or assets that we have as a, as a non-profit. Uh, however, recently, and uh, mainly um, after the pandemic, we also noticed that um, this is not always evident in, in terms of supporting or philanthropic uh, donations. Um, this kind of uh, second layer of foundations as, as the trust also faces different challenges in terms of uh, gathering new funding because um, many of the private sector or other uh, international uh, donors don't cover, for example, operational costs. Uh, so that uh, also required um, uh, adaptation and, and, and try to um, adapt, well, basically adapt the model uh, to continue impacting the communities we serve. Thank you. We are open for questions. Uh, we have two already, I think, on the chat, uh, and we are happy to take from the audience here as well, but while you gather your thoughts, um, let's take the first question from ah, my friend Nena. Can somebody unmute her, please? Uh, 
I hope someone can hear me. I still can't have my... Can we, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. So this has been um, a very insightful panel, and I'm happy I, I hopped in. Uh, Helani, here is where I'm thinking. In as much as we might want to talk about partnerships between private, uh, public, or uh, at international levels, my question is at the national level, because that is where the rubber hits the road. What kind of national partnerships between private sector, civil society, and governments are needed for us to have a robust uh, data economy. So my question is on national uh, partnerships, because for me, that is where the rubber hits the road. Whether it is private data, whether it is government data, open data, what kind of partnerships do we need at national level? Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to take the question? National level partnerships? I, I can jump in um, really quick. In terms of uh, national partnership um, and private sector data, uh, what has uh, worked a lot for us and um, based on some activities we develop uh, with a regional, regional perspective, in terms of using data for uh, social and economic development, uh, such as um, hackathons or uh, other initiatives where youth can use data to create their solutions. Um, it has um, worked a lot in terms of um, uh, partnerships, working uh, between the private sector and uh, national ministries, uh, depending on, on the topic. Uh, but since inception, in terms of um, defining the data sets and uh, being very specific on where we want to uh, focus on the solutions. Um, there's always um, um, a challenge in terms of creating um, specific, um, um, specific outcomes in terms of uh, the use of the data. So uh, since the inception, I believe that uh, national ministries are important to, to be involved in the discussion. Uh, if I may add, I think, yeah, whether it's a ministry or whether it's a trusted third party or a not-for-profit, but I think somebody needs to be involved because a lot of the time, the value of this data is if multiple companies come together and multiple government departments come together. And particularly if companies are coming together, commercial sensitivity arises. So, you know, the classic example of um, taxi data, you know, in a country, let's say like Sri Lanka, they will, you know, Uber will have Uber's data, the two local companies will have their own data, but it's in the pooling that's really valuable for each of the other companies as well. But then there's commercially sensitive data. So who is going to be trusted, whether it's a government entity and so on, I think. We have another question, uh, unless one of the panelists wants to, panelists wants to respond uh, to Nena's question from Ayalewe uh, Shebeshi. And I'm sorry, I might be mispronouncing your name. If you can speak, or Maurice, our online moderator, can read out her question. Maurice, you want to go? Okay. I know we can't unmute, so Maurice, you will have to be it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to uh, just read my question. Um, I'm sure um, I joined this um, IGF in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia last year. Um, then I was advocating, um, asking question for the uh, secretariat to have international uh, standard. So what we do now is uh, we have partnership, private and par uh, a public partnership. Uh, every country has a different um, a data. Every country has different regulation and rules and um, uh, every country has also a different licensing. 
So um, in terms of uh, accessible data, which is information, uh, I think uh, we need to set up international standard at least. Uh, so as we see now is each country has tried to uh, tackle with the uh, local government and then also some of the sponsors. And um, as uh, we observed, uh, there is a big issue, uh, uh, some of the obstacle of the uh, private uh, um, company to access the, com the uh, government data. The government is not allowed to them to do what they, what they want to do. So that's actually uh, create ob obstacle for the uh, improvement of the technology. So uh, my understanding, my question is now, how we set up uh, a standard for uh, uh, international um, uh, standard like United Nations IGF, um, at least for the basic uh, framework, then follow that and it will by the two by laws, the country law, international law um, or standards, and then mm. um, they can at least start up uh, basic um, uh, standards uh, all over together, especially um, the South South uh, cooperation will be important in the future, and we need to concentrate and set up the rule. Otherwise, uh, it will be distorted uh, data setup and um, uh, use of the technology improvement. So, uh, what are the initiatives? My question is, what are the initiatives from this uh, IGA is actually set up for the uh, Internet Governance Forum, international governance law? That's my question. So thank you so much. Thank you for your question. I mean, there's certainly multiple discussions around cross-border data transfer, and I think the answer in part probably depends on the sensitivity of the data. It also probably screams for a Japan uh, government of Japan representative on this panel to talk about uh, cross-border data transfer with trust, which is one of the initiatives that they have proposed, and there was actually a panel on it yesterday. But to the panelists about uh, international standards uh, to share data across. What can we do? I think, Mona, you kind of touched upon that a little bit, but is there any activity at an international level happening on this? So I could cover actually the, uh, the MENA region context. So what, what we've been doing uh, recently, um, uh, and, and, and let's say an international team, which compare, uh, it's comprised from the MENA region representative countries, they actually came together uh, to come with something called, um, they started with something called the AI, uh, ethics in the MENA region, then they created the strategy, and now they're working on more on the data itself. So the way I would say that we, I think we all still baby steps everywhere. And I, I would I would say that uh, people are still figuring out and countries, governments are still figuring out on which, which aspects we need actually to focus on more, especially when it comes to uh, data sharing. Um, again, as you said, the sensitivity is something that's still super, super important for us to focus on. And I, I would say generally that Things are moving. We're still not uh, moving very fast. However, I could see in the MENA region, for example, as I said, most countries now they have their strategies. Now most countries now actually working on the ethics. More countries now are seeing how they could start working on the data sharing component. I, to be honest, I don't have the um, let, let's say the accurate answer for such a, such a question. But some movements are working there, and I will see something coming in the upcoming two years. Hopefully. Thank Maybe you, Mona. Maybe Darlington want to add something. Uh, thank you. I think we are nearly at the end of the session. There's uh, a comment from the MENA region about how uh, the uh, data philanthropy has to be fully participatory and inclusive. And a really interesting comment from Weiyu online about, which says the fact of private data partnerships is that big techs treat different countries differently. For instance, they give data access to US academics, but not Singaporean academics. The global south is again at a disadvantage and we need to do something to change this imbalance. The previous question on international standards is very relevant here. I would very much agree. Uh, and I think we're out of time, but there is a question from a colleague from Ghana. Uh, and I'm going to read it given the, uh, a small amount of time. With recent acceptance of technology and management systems in Africa, especially in the health sector, what would be your advice to all these African countries in terms of interoperability and sharing of data in the absence of regional data protection laws. So I think along the same lines, really important. I know 
there are sort of regional initiatives uh, that are happening, uh, but perhaps not fast enough. Uh, and the best example from the Central Bank Digital Currency International Data Transactions, uh, SWIFT versus BRICS, uh, as the international standard has been pointed out. So that's just some of the summary. Two things we would ask of you and the panelists. The first is a very quick two-minute poll. If you can go to slido.com, slido.com, www.slido.com, Isuru, if you can project that, and you enter this code, and there's one question we would like you to answer. If you go to slido.com and enter 2763179, the question is, the main reason preventing private sector sharing their data that can help monitor achieve the SDGs is three of these options. Which one? And while everyone does that, I'm going to ask the panelists a question. Whoa, lack of incentives. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, unified on the lack of incentives to do so. Oh, not so much, okay. It, while it's going on live, could the panelists think about, if you had one ask of, in the case of um, the private sector, if you had one ask of government, if you could change one thing that they do differently, what would it be? That's a question to Mike uh, and to Darlington. Uh, what would you ask them to do differently when it comes to public-private data sharing? Uh, from uh, Rodrigo, I'm going to ask, what would you ask private sector to do differently and government to do differently? One thing. Uh, and the same question from Mona. Thank you, everybody. So the broad consensus, 75 roughly, three-fourths, the lack of incentives. The second is low capacity of governments and a few responses for policies that actually prevent data sharing. Thank you. Closing round, one minute interventions. I will start with Mike. Uh, well, first let me just say, I think uh, you know, the, the collaboration between you know, our organization and governments around the world is generally quite good. Uh, and we, you know, we very much appreciate the the partnerships uh, that we enjoy with with governments around the world to solve some of our very difficult challenges. Uh, I think um, someone mentioned earlier uh, international standards uh, for data protection. Uh, certainly, it would be uh, certainly I, I think it would be helpful for everyone uh, if we had more uh, more global standardization uh, on data privacy, data protection. Uh, that would uh, make it much easier to operate on a global scale. I'm not sure if it's me. I've lost. Uh, I've lost the ability to hear you. Thank you, Mike. I was asking Darlington. What's your one ask? Yeah, my biggest ask will be that you know government should have the political will to form these partnerships. Uh, it makes all the difference. So. The difference between you know having a few agencies within government willing to form PPPs and how far these PPPs go usually tends to be on the political will, and it makes all the difference. So more governments across different countries, more agencies should internally have that bind. They should see the benefit of this partnership, how it could lead to you know solving the toughest challenges that are within the country, either by using data to better understand them or building AI solutions with that data that can help address those problems. But there needs to be that political will internally okay. to make it happen. Thank you. Uh, Mona, I'll come to you next. Yeah, for the governments, I would say that they have to work on establishing a governance structure to ensure that everybody's involved and to push having uh, data shared. For the private sector, simply, I would say, and that's based on my experience, they need to work more on understanding how AI could help them and understanding the importance of access structuring and labeling their data and making it usable for everybody to use. Thank you. Rodrigo. Thanks. 
for the private sector, I would say um, to be more flexible and open, we're working with uh, government entities and share best practices as they uh, operate very differently. And for the public sector, I would say to strengthen the capacities uh, and um, create a process inside the government to, to develop um, uh, and establish a data culture in, their, uh, in the public um, offices. Thank you. So political will, capacity, and data culture within government private sector to be a lot more willing to collaborate um, because they work at different uh, uh, um, sort of time scales and across countries and international agreement on how we can share data across borders and international privacy and related laws and uh, protection so we can sort of without worrying um, enter into partnerships. Thank you to the panelists and Isuru and as the presenter. Thank you to the online audience and the in-person audience. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of IGF. <laughs>